Today's episode of Plastic Weekly is brought to you by Climbers Rock, my old home gym, the first place I started climbing. They've been supporting me from then all the way up till now. Thanks so much, guys. Enjoy the episode. I'm back with Charlie Bosco for part two of our interview. If you haven't watched uh, the first segment where we talk about him and his background and how he got to this place as the uh, presenter for the IFSC, you can uh, check out the link. I'm going to try and point to the right corner. So, yeah, it's over there. I'll put a put a little link up in that corner to that uh, part one. Uh, but today we were going to try and actually talk about uh, broadcasting for climbing and climbing itself because I know you've got some like pretty strong opinions and it's something you obviously spend so much time in you can't not care about it uh, and and uh, care about how it develops. So I figure we may as well start from the broadcasting side. And I think the, the best place to start off is, uh, like I said, you're heavily involved in it. You are, in a lot of ways, the kind of definitive singular voice of competition climbing and and so you you well who else like I, you know you're just i'm not you know you're just in that spot and so yeah. the, the the question i want to ask first of all is um because you spend so much time in it you think about it all the time if you had to have if there was one thing in particular where you kind of say to yourself i wish we were doing this better and when I say we, I mean yourself, the IFSC kind of broadcasting for the IFSC. What's the one thing you you really wish uh, you guys could improve sooner than later? I would like to go. You put me on the spot there. I would like to uh, really get some more advanced graphics. I kind of feel like there must be scope for some more advanced graphics. Uh, the question uh, is always a question of budget mm -hmm. and you need someone to design them. You need someone to test them. You need someone to actually do them during the live stream. We've got a very small crew. One guy's directing, one guy's putting up the existing graphics. He's teeing up the next graphics. One guy's, uh, used doing the wall mounted cameras. Someone else is doing the cable cam. That's everyone. Um, so we don't really have time for someone to man, um, an advanced graphic, for example, like a moving graphic or a graphic that stayed on the wall and showed a high point while the next person was climbing. Uh, but it, yeah, that, that seems like something we could really work on. And then Mike Langley and I just talk about what we're doing pretty much all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's it's just an ongoing process of, of evolution and trying to improve. And, um, yeah, the, I wouldn't say there's anything specific, but every week we watch back what we did and what we talked about and how we talked about it. And we we generally have a pretty long call after each um, weekend and, and just try and figure out what, what we could do better. But I think with commentary, it's kind of a more subtle thing than um, than having a concrete goal. I think it's it's just something that slowly evolves and improves. I want to specifically ask about the graphics thing because that was kind of my next question is is uh, there are other competitions, um, smaller comps, some are national, some are local that d have put money into graphics. And, and, you know, when you're running a one off comp or you have sponsorship and you've got a specific geographic area, sometimes it's easier. Um, so we're seeing a lot of innovation in particular in just the last couple of weeks. The British Bouldering Championships continued to improve on their really impressive uh, graphics for their uh, scoring and then they added in some kind of context uh, this year with little pop-ups of, uh, of information um, when you think about the IFSC stuff yourself as a commentator it's your job to tell this story and that can be incredibly difficult with you know the one camera angle on on the wall that you are given at a time uh, what would you find the most helpful for yourself at this point um I feel like some sort of visual representation of what the climber needs to do in order to achieve a certain result. Okay. And I don't really know what form that would take. I think in lead, it's probably quite obvious. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like in bouldering, the scoring system, it, it's, it's not complicated, but it seems complicated. It is. And it involves math. Like you have to do it yeah. in your head. You know? yeah, I've got, I've screwed it up enough times, so it's, it's not that easy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it, it, yeah, I, f I feel like some visual representation of what's required um, would be would be the way to go. Um, I think, and also I don't want to kind of tread on the toes of the people I actually work for no. and say what they should spend their money on. But uh, this year they've invested in uh, massively improved camera equipment. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really talk about finances with them, but perhaps that was at the expense of investing in graphics. Sure. Uh, perhaps it was instead of. Um, and what I would say about the, the smaller comps is that these are generally done in the home city of mm -hmm. the people producing the broadcast. Yeah. And that's uh, in, in our defense. Um, 
not that we can't improve, but in our defence, I would say that the key point is that everything we do is mobile. And so um, there's a popular uh, bouldering competition in Stuttgart sponsored by a well-known three-stripe sports brand. Mm -hmm. um, and their budget for that event is twice the IFSC's annual broadcast budget. Sure. So if they weren't producing something significantly better uh, for twice what it costs us to go around the world for 15 events, I'd be... I would I would be really worried. So I would say I would say uh, in the case of Stuttgart and the British Bouldering Champs and things that those guys are operating in their hometown, so they can bring everything, including the kitchen sink. Whereas we have to be mobile, mm -hmm. um, which, which does limit us slightly, but that's not in any way to sort of uh, dodge the question. I'll say we couldn't be better. Uh, one one thing that's always made me curious and a little bit frustrated is that the IFSC in the past has, and I believe it was when there were uh, different production companies. It sounds like uh, you mentioned in the previous uh, session that when you came on as a presenter in 2016, they also changed their uh, production company for the broadcast. Uh, but I remember World Cups where there was a linear graphic showing where first place was and where second and third was. And I remember having persistent name graphics on the, on the screen all the time. Um, it, it, does that kind of imply that those graphics were kind of like in-house to those companies and they were able to keep that, those tools or innovation? I'm not really sure where the disconnect is between the, the broadcast having that in previous years and it no longer being present. I don't know the answer to that question. I know our guys okay. design, I know that our guys design their graphics. So mm -hmm. they, do the, they do the graphic design literally the graphic design and um i know there are some constraints from the ifsc about um so for example split screens are out like if you're hanging on for split screens get comfy because they're okay. not coming any time soon <laughs> um so what's the what's the reasoning so, behind that i'm not a huge fan of them uh and if you don't i I, I honestly don't know i'm it sounds really bad and it, but as regards split screens and improved graphics i kind of one of I kind of take care of what I can get care of, sure. And I don't really get involved too much. If they say split screens are out, uh, I just accept it and get on with it. Well, let me just, let me ask you a question. Cause cause I, well, split screens are are kind of like a some people like them, some people don't. It it can make it. I'm imagine it's fairly difficult for camera operators as well when you have a smaller field uh, to shoot somebody in. Um, but it, is that something that would help you tell a story if you had a split screen? No, no, I, I, I would never be an advocate of split screen. I think it, there's almost no sport in the world. Is there a sport in the world where they have split screen? I can't, I certainly can't think of one. I mean, if you look, like if you can tell the story of a NASCAR race or a Formula One race mm -hmm. or a round of golf for the 70 people in the course, if you can do that without a split screen, we don't need one in climbing. Sure. And uh, one of the first things you get told when you're learning to live broadcast is talk about what's on the screen. Yeah. If, if if you ever start talking about something that isn't what the viewers are watching, it's totally jarring and it sounds out of place. And I was guilty of it, uh, certainly for the first couple of years at the IFSC, because mm. you kind of feel like, say, in the lead semi-final, everyone's falling off at the same point, for example. Sure. And you feel like you need to add something to this otherwise not very good show. And I would just ask a guest about uh, anything and... Um, it didn't seem right to me. When I watched them back, it was jarring. And mm -hmm. actually, you have to just say, there's another person falling off on hole 24. Let's see what the next person can do. And it might not be that entertaining, but you have to follow what's on the screen. And I think sure. if we had split screens, you might be thinking, right, can't wait. I'm, gonna, I'm, just, I'm just focusing on the men's. And I'll be talking about the women's, which might be underneath. Mm -hmm. Might be the bottom half of the split screen. And it would it would sound pretty crap. So, so I think... Um, you, we should be able to tell the story about split screen. Are there any broadcasts that you've seen uh, that you particularly admire for what they're doing in terms of, of the broadcast technology, whether it's graphics or, or uh, just how they manage their cameras in the particular competition? Uh, I would say Formula One racing. It's one of the few uh, sports I, I watch. It's ideal for flights. Uh, sure. Because you just kind of zone into it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I generally, when when we're flying, I generally watch that. Big shank, big thanks to Eddie Falk, by the way, who uh, hooked me up with some site <laughs> where you get all the races. Um, yeah, I would say them because you got 20 cars on a track which could be three miles long. Uh, they 
they follow them, they figure out where the story is, and they stick with the appropriate battle. They must, I, I dread to think how many cameras they must have, two helicopters in the air. Um, and I think they do a really good job of following. I think they're, they're onboard graphics now. Um, for people that aren't familiar with it, they have, um, where, where my hand's visible, here we go. You got it. They have a, <laughs> on, on one side, they'll have a break and a throttle. And as the driver presses it, it'll increase, and the other one will increase as they press them. Really? So you can actually see in real time what the driver's doing, and you can see what gear they're in, what revs they're in. Um, I find that really, really pretty slick. Uh, but I, they, I would assume, have a significantly higher budget than the IFSC. Sure, yeah. I, 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 think, I think the guy sold the business, for, sold Formula One for $4 billion, so geez. we're not quite there j just yeah. yet. A yeah. few zeros, sure. Yeah. A little ways off, yeah. Um, speaking about, uh, uh, you said you you spent a lot of time reflecting with uh, with Mike Langley after each uh, competition. Uh, is is that something you want to have more of? Like having a, you generally always have a partner. Uh, through the bouldering season, it was usually an athlete, and for the last three rope events, it's been uh, uh, Mike. Um, and I guess he compliments you in the sense that he's uh, been involved in climbing itself indoors as a root setter. And, and uh, I, I don't know what else he's uh, done, maybe some coaching, but he's been involved in that world. Um, do you, I guess I'll start, would you rather have somebody with his background uh, beside you for most of the events? Or do you prefer this balance where you're back and forth between an athlete's perspective and a root setter's perspective? I'd rather have Mike in everything. Okay. Um, but and is that is that because he's a presenter as well, or is that because of his his kind of like root setting uh, background? Well, uh, the first thing to say is the reason he's not there is again it's a question of budget. So Mike sure. comes to everything in Europe, sure, and uh, he doesn't go beyond outside Europe. He doesn't actually. Mike wouldn't want to do a full IFSC season. He's okay. got a life and things, but I I would like him to do one. And he's coming to Japan. Oh, great for the for the world champs. Yeah, I know. Really, really good. Uh, we're arriving at the same time, so we're going to have to negotiate the metro together. Um, <laughs> Make sure you take a vlog of that. We want to we want to see how that works out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to wangle a transfer out of the organizer, but then we'll see if we can get it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would I would have Mike at everything because um, it took it's actually taken a lot of work with Mike and I, and a lot of studying other people. Um, sure. Although we get support from the IFSC, nobody actually in the IFSC is a broadcaster. Mm -hmm. That's on um, that's me. So we studied other sports and we kind of figured out how, how do we do this? How do we split it? When do you talk and when do I talk? And him and I have spent a long time sending each other clips of, of look how they interact, look how he asks this question, look how he asks that question. And it feels like it's really coming along. And we've now got very, very clearly defined roles. And I never, I, I hope I never step into his role and he never steps into mine and that's just something that takes a long time and i think if you look at how the nfl is broadcast uh, which i watch and and various other sports they, they tend to keep people together for a long time joe joe buck and troy aikman have been together a long time in the nfl because it takes a long time for that chemistry to develop and for you to really get that relationship and that understanding of he's about to speak i'm going to shut up uh he's swimming he, he's 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 struggling. I'm going to jump in and help him. That just takes a long time. And, and when I work with the athletes, sometimes they can just come out with some absolute gems. And you do get that unique perspective. But I don't think you get that slick, polished uh, thing, which Mike and I don't always get, but we're always aiming for. And I think, um, yeah, I think the the athlete the athletes can be really good, but um, they don't have that instinct necessarily of when to talk and what to say and when to say it. And I think that's something Mike and I have really like, consciously worked on and it's beginning to come together. Are there any particular uh, commentary pairs that you started to look up to or that you feel like uh, you guys are following in the, in the model of? Generally, I really like one side of a commentary duo. <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, uh, I like Joe Buck and Troy Aitman. I think... Um, Jim Nance and Tony, Tony Romo on the NFL have been an absolute revelation. Um, I'm sensing from your blank look that this is no, yeah, this. I'm, I'm following. I'm just trying to see where, where like, uh, which, right. uh, which, yeah. which ones of these pairs I think that you uh, appreciate the most. I like Jim Nance and Tony Romo. I like them both. I think they okay. work great. Tony Romo has been a sensation for people that don't watch the NFL. He mm. calls plays just before they happen. Sure, yeah, so it's about to be the snap, and he'll go. They're running this and they're going left. 
and then mm. it'll happen. It's incredible. Yeah. And he got there's like amazing YouTube compilations of him doing it. Uh, and Jim Nance, I think, kind of knew that he had this genius on his hands, and he's let him run with it. So, yeah. and I think that takes a really, uh, really big person to kind of let go of of being the star. And so I think they've managed their relationship really well. I think it's um, a great pair in terms of that. Jim, Jim is often, you know, as much as he can take up a room, and he's got a massive ego as well. He uh, leaves a lot of space, and it might be, especially having spent so much time in golf, he is he's naturally developed this idea of I'm just going to set this up, and then we're going to see what happens. And I think that leaves a lot of room for somebody like Tony, right? But yeah, I agree. And and silence is mm-hmm. the most powerful thing you can say. And if you can get your timing right, like just get that, like a comic. Um, you know, if you a comedian, if you can get your timing right and know when to be silent, it can be so powerful. I, I, sorry, I didn't realize you knew who I was talking about when I was saying Tony Romo. No, it's all good. Answer. Yeah, I spend oh, a lot of time watching this stuff too. It's you know, I, I don't commentate as much as I as much as I want to. There's only so many comps in Canada, but uh, yeah, it's something I I'm really interested in, of course, as well. Yeah, they're, they're great, and I, I um, Phil Liggett and Paul Sherwin, who did the Tour de France for years. Uh, I've never watched much uh, Tour de France, so that's... Uh, I kind of gone off there. I, sure. I just feel like the doping scandals are kind of piling up so much, it's kind of okay. hard to know what to believe. But yeah. um, Phil Liggett, I knew as a kid and uh, obviously didn't really appreciate who he was, but now we kind of keep in touch. And he's been the voice of cycling for probably 50 years now. Mm-hmm. Uh, sadly, Paul Sherwin died last year, but they... Um, they had a very good relationship, and again, like a, I think a mutually respectful relationship. So I like them, and I think uh, Martin Brundle on the Formula One is probably right. the best broadcaster I've ever heard. Hmm. Um, so, but I don't really like his partner that much. Okay. So <laughs> I'm pretty picky, but it, off the top of my head, uh, they they would be people I like. Oh, and I like uh, I really like Miles Harrison, who works for Sky Sports on their rugby coverage. Okay. But um. Yeah, I, I think the the relationship between the two and figuring out who does what and how to do it takes a long time and is quite a subtle science. But when you get it right, it's the best feeling. Yeah. Um, is there when you think about your your pairing? This is probably the end of end, end of this section. But when you when you think about your pairing with uh, with Mike, what kind of territory do you? Uh, and this is I don't know if this is even relevant to other people, but it's curious for me. Where do you find you uh, fit yourself in? Uh, in that pair, like what responsibilities do you find you take as part of that partnership? So the classic division of labor in a commentary box is the co- the play by play guy says what is happening, color commentator says why. Mm-hmm. That's the divi- that's the division of labor. So that's what Mike and I try and do. When the climber comes out, I'll say who it is, what their recent results are, how old they are, how they did in the previous round, uh, what happened to them in the semi final. I'll say what is happening. They're starting the route now. Six minutes begins. I, I'm saying what people can see. And it sounds ridiculous because they can see it. But it's what uh, happens in the NFL. The, co- the co-commentator is there and Mike is there to say why it's happening. And I think if you see that, uh, you really see that. For example, in the NFL, Jim Nance will say Brady drops back, finds Edelman on the 38-yard line for a gain of six. Now, I can see Brady drop back, I can see through it to Edelman, and I can see they've gained six, but it's still his job to say it. And at that point, the color commentator would jump in and say, well, the reason I think he went to Edelman was they had Gronkowski covered over on the left, and that left Edelman open. And then it goes back to the play-by-play guy. So Mike and I try and split it that way, where I'll say what's happening, and he'll say why. And that's what I try and get athletes to do. And sometimes I'll, I'll look at them and just think, you know, now's the time to be saying why. <laughs> Um, so that, that's how we try and split it. Uh, so NFL is, uh, we'll use this as a parallel for now. NFL has, uh, you have a pre-show with a panel. You've got the commentators. You've got analysts in game. You have sideline reporters. You've got post-game reporters. Uh, there is a, a huge talent pool with all of these people uh, doing different parts of, of the coverage. Um, starting this year, not at the last couple, but in in the first few events of the year, uh, you had other people doing the post uh, event interviews, and it seemed like that might be uh, a move towards trying to um, have uh, have somebody in a role of kind of like a uh, sideline reporter, sort of. Uh, do you see? Well, let's start with that. Um, 
that seems to have ended. It seems to be you now doing the uh, uh, end of broadcast winners interviews. How has that uh, evolved over the season? What was going on with all of that? Uh, I do them when Mike's there and I don't when Mike is not there. Perfect. Easy answer. There we go. All right. Yeah, because uh, <laughs> because it's it's a big thing to ask someone, particularly as we don't generally get much prep time with the athletes. Someone mm-hmm. will volunteer and I might have half an hour. It's a big call for me to turn the director on in their ear because during the broadcast I can hear the director and the athlete can't mm-hmm. by choice. I turn the I turn the director sure. off so they yeah. can hear it. It's a big call for me to say, hey, by the way, I'm going to turn the director on. You just fill for two minutes while I get down there, and sure. then when he tells you, you've got to throw to me. Yeah. Like, and I just we we tried it. I think I kind of dropped Josh Levin in it with about ten seconds warning <laughs> in Moscow. We tried it. And he actually managed it fine, mm-hmm. but it's it's a lot to ask of someone. And so when Mike isn't there and, and, and can't hold the reins himself and I get myself to the interview pen, uh, we, we get someone else to do it. And it could be, it's basically whoever's available and is willing to do it and speaks English. So we had Eddie doing it for right. uh, quite a few. But yeah, it's, it's basically if I'm there, I do them. Uh, so if Mike's there, I do them. Uh, there, there are some instances where you, obviously we've we've had uh, Chai Hin Seo now uh, win a few of these events, and it seems like uh, there isn't somebody available to translate. Uh, this is just kind of a, a little detour. The the countries that do have somebody there helping you translate, I'm assuming they're not a translator as their job. I imagine there's some other part of the yeah. organization, right? Um, how how is that evolving? Like, I mean, I. Something I've always been a little bit sad about is the lack of uh, athlete-specific reporting at events to fill us in on injuries, to ask questions to a lot of athletes about their performances. Um, so I'm guessing translators just aren't a thing, and you do kind of have to know the people. Um, how is that something that you see any chance of that evolving or changing over the next little bit? Have you spoken to uh, Chai Hun's family about trying to find somebody in the area of each event that speaks Korean and English? Like, is that a possibility? I, I don't think there's any possibility in the foreseeable future of a designated translator sure. going. But I agree that it, it robs us of getting to know the climbers. And I think that's something you see with the Japanese team is that we, I, I don't feel I know the climbers in the same way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I'm sure people at home feel the same. I actually ran into Tomoe and his brother in, Tomoe Narasaki and his brother in Innsbruck I was uh, training at a CrossFit gym and he walked past. <laughs> dread to think what it must have looked like. Um, uh, but, and again, like your conversation is so limited to here for training. Yeah, here for training. How's it going? Um, and so I would like to hear more from the athletes, but we're not going to get any designated translators anytime soon, sadly. Um, and it does, it makes it really hard, those live interviews. And some, some people have said in the comments, oh my God, Charlie speaks to them like they're idiots. He suddenly starts speaking slowly and you're like, well, I, if I, I really should start speaking slowly and ask her a very simple question. I mean, I'm not gonna, we're not gonna go into the the depths of human physiology and exactly mm. how she did that drop knee. Yeah. Um, and I think it does it does uh, definitely take something away when we have someone whose whose English is not great for a sure. live interview. But we work with what we've got. And even if you've got a translator, we had Hidamasa. We we're recording this a week after Brianson. We had Hidamasa Nishida one. And we had uh, Takako Hoshi, who uh, speaks really good English on the Japanese team, translating. And he, he just didn't want to say much. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's no guarantee that you get a lot out of them. Sure. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like it's it's kind of a shame when we don't hear more from the non-English speakers. But sadly, it's we're going to be relying on friends, family, coaches, anyone who can translate. Following down that that uh, that little rabbit hole of talking about um, reporters doing other contexts, I did, occasionally comments will come up uh, in in our debrief stream or uh, or after somebody will write a piece about a competition and somebody will point out missing context. Perhaps um, I, one in particular was uh, we we talked about an American's result without knowing that he got injured in qualifications and and that kind of uh, invalidated what we were talking about when we reflected on his result. And that was at an event where the camera panned a few times to massive pools of people in press vests, right? Like probably hundreds of people covering the event, mostly with cameras. Um, this was at Munich. There's just tons of people in the uh, in the crowd uh, there to cover the event, uh, but fairly little information uh, about these 
happenings throughout the event actually make it out into the public. You know, there isn't anybody there writing up injury reports, although boring stuff like that would probably normally uh, be through like um, through a league reporting kind of thing. Like I would go to to NHL.com if I wanted to know what was going on with stuff like that. Um, There are a lot of people covering these events, but I feel like there's still a tremendous amount of room for written or video reporting rather than just photography. Um, am I just missing something? Or are they covering it in a different language or for 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 uh, outlets that I'm not aware of? Do you know of anybody that's there as something other than a photojournalist? Because we seem to have a glut of, and actually a lot of incredible photojournalists. That's something we've actually got a really good uh, chunk of, but the other stuff seems to be missing. Yeah, I agree. And I've, uh, I've started writing a competition report as as of the start of the lead season every week for UKclimbing.com. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's very much my opinion, my thoughts, my, if you like, insider's view. For me, it's difficult because I work for the IFSC and therefore I don't feel it's my place to uh, broadcast something that the athlete hasn't chosen to broadcast. Um, so if the athlete's injured and they don't put it on their social media, I don't feel it's on me. I'm just kind of conscious of, of who I work for and what my role is. And uh, may, now I listen to myself, I feel like I'm kind of dodging the question here. Um, but I I think because climbing is such a small world still, if we take the comparison of Formula One, uh, you've got these huge teams, media everywhere, and the way you get ahead is by finding that story that everyone doesn't have. And climbing is such a small world right now and everyone knows everyone. And I feel like if you did something to betray an athlete's trust, sorry, turn that off. Um, if you did something to betray an athlete's trust, that would kind of hold you back in the future. And I think personally, I think that's the reason why um, people don't give a lot of behind the scenes um reportage because they don't want to betray someone's trust in this very small world where access is limited to other it looks like a lot of people or a relatively small number and um whether that's right or wrong and whether that's sustainable and how it'll stay is another matter but i i uh, certainly for me my relationship with the athletes is worth more than a scoop um i think i dodged the question I, I get, something I've had to think about um, is in the broadcasting that I've done, a lot of it has been youth climbing, right? Uh, two of three nationals in Canada are youth climbing specific. Uh, but the other thing that's a reality about all Canadian climbers, um, aside from maybe Sean, is that they are not professionals. They are amateurs, right? They are earning zero dollars or slightly more than zero dollars. Uh, and even in World Cup climbing, that's a reality about most of those climbers as well. Like if they're lucky, they have support from a federation, but they're not making any kind of livelihood from it. And so it sometimes it is, you know, I want to, especially in terms of broadcasting, where you want to uh, offer criticism uh, of performance right like it's their athletes this is a show sometimes stuff happens and you want to criticize not out of malice but out of analysis and sometimes i i almost always stop myself because it feels unfair first of all in a lot of cases because they are kids and i don't think it is fair to give that much attention to uh, something like that when they're young but even for adults even for someone like sean mccall who's who's the definition of a veteran in this sport um There's part of it where you say, like, you know, he's getting by in this sport. He's got lots of sponsors, and I'm sure that keeps him comfortably getting through this endeavor as a competitive climber. But it's I almost still don't want to call him a professional athlete, right? There is still an element of amateurness to even all of our top athletes, and that kind of stops me from going too hard on any of them. Yeah, Uh, and uh, yeah, and and also I would say on that, um, I try to give an opinion if I can. But uh, like I say, um, I've been at the IFSC four years. Uh, I hope I'm going to be back next season and the season after that. So you've you got to have a long-term relationship with people. And sometimes I just feel like digging people out just isn't worth what it'll cost. And that's not to make the commentary bland. But I, I think uh, but I think if you watch most sports, if you watch the NFL, they very rarely just really rip into someone. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, and so... 
yeah, I feel like I'm always treading that line between saying what I think and being able to justify it. And the line I heard drawn, and I think this is probably the best place you can draw the line, is there's a rugby commentator, and he said, does it pass the mum filter? So <laughs> would I be willing to say it to his mum? And right. he said, if I'd be willing to look his mum in the eye and say what I think, then then I'll say it on the air. And I try and abide by that as well, which is if I'm going to accuse someone of a lack of effort or a really bad mistake, I better be pretty sure that what I'm saying is right. Um, and I, I just think it's a fine line. And there are some topics I just don't go near. Sure. Um, the climbers being too thin topic is yeah. not something you're going to hear discussed on the IFSC live stream no. because I, nobody is winning out of that. No matter what I say, I'm going to get buried. Yeah. Um, and I don't know what people's history is. And I lived with a guy at university, looked like a, a skeleton with skin, and all he did was eat. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know who's healthy and unhealthy. I'm just saying I just leave that topic alone. Sure. Um, and that, yeah, the the how much of an opinion to express and when to criticize people is just uh, a really hard thing to do. And also when to say something you know from behind the scenes that the athlete hasn't shared via their social media. Um, is, is a big decision and I can only speak for me personally but I don't generally say anything I haven't seen elsewhere but whether, whether people reporting from the World Cup should be a little more um, ruthless with dispensing information is another question Someone like yourself where you travel with the circuit and and I don't know how much you socialize with uh, with the athletes. I know there's a certain amount of crossover just because you're all staying in the same little resort town or whatever. You're at the same after party or you're just in the crowd together. And then I know there are uh, other journalists that sometimes they end up staying with the athletes to help cut down their costs as they travel around the circuit. Um, do you feel like it's not clear that you're members of the media? Like I... They, you might spend time with them. You might have breakfast with them before the big event. They go off to ISO. You go off to the to the media section. Uh, but do you feel that uh, line is getting blurred? Because to a lot of us, it's obvious that this is a photojournalist. This is a writer. You are the commentator and kind of the the voice of what's going on. Do you feel the athletes uh, don't understand that, or do you do you find you're just being torn because of the kind of the intimacy of the scene? I just think it's. Um a naturally ongoing process to figure out um, how much opinion to give and, and how much personal information about the athletes to give away. And it's just an ongoing thing. And, and um, I would say I try to keep uh, a distance from the athletes to an extent. Um, you know, I kind of, you kind of hear sometimes in the climbing media, this sickly desire to be friends with people. I'm friends sure. with the athletes. And I think, well, is that really appropriate? I mean, can you imagine Jim Nance try, make a conscious effort to be friends with Tom Brady? <laughs> Probably not. I would imagine he he is uh, friendly, professional, respectful, polite, mm -hmm. but they're not friends. And and I think that's appropriate because um, ultimately, I try and not give like too much too much opinion or, or or an opinion that would be too controversial or would upset the athlete. But I have to give an opinion. And if they bin it at the third quick draw, I've got to say, wow, it really fluffed a pretty pretty simple move there. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I like to think the athletes, uh, I have a friendly relationship with all the athletes, but I would not say, with, very, with a few exceptions, I would not say I'm friends with the athletes. And that's a conscious choice. And I think, yeah, this, this sometimes like a bit, a bit desperate desire to be friends with the climbers is something that the climbing world has to go out of. We're members of the media and we've got to, um, respect that we're members of the media talking about other people and making judgments about them. So I keep I keep a uh, I keep a small distance between me with with a few exceptions of people that I, would, I really would say are, are friends. All right. This ends up being a really good segue into the uh, talking about the competition part. Uh, in the last part of the interview, um, in one of those moments where we almost started talking about climbing, uh, you said uh, that climbing still needs to slightly get over this, oh, we're super friendly, I don't care if I don't win as long as my friend gets to win uh, kind of attitude. Um, let's start talking about climbing uh, and let's start by talking about this kind of attitude issue. Uh, in the last couple of years or in the last couple of months, I've uh, 
been able to observe Canada going through this um, uh, reevaluation of our values uh, as a sport of competitive climbing, as as our federations kind of uh, get mixed about and and uh, figure out what their role is. And one thing came up was the idea of of community that climbing seems to be inherently more friendly or more considerate or less uh, less combative than other sports. Uh, and it sounds like you're seeing uh, that at the high levels as well, and that seems to not that you're against uh, civility, because you also mentioned that it's very reasonable for high-level athletes to be friends with each other and still be strongly competitive. But it seems like you don't feel that a lot of climbers uh, are as competitive or as... Um, uh, I'm just going to no, backtrack. I, I feel I think you know where I'm going, but I think you feel no, that you, it might be I a little bit too soft and that you want to see climbers expressing their genuine desire to win if it exists. Yeah, well, this we didn't rehearse this. This really segues between um, what I just said as well about having to dig people out. And my UK climbing article uh, this week, they're getting some good publicity here. You should charge them. Um, <laughs> uh, I said about Sean Bailey, mm -hmm. uh, and I said he came down from the wall, women's finals underway. I look over, and I can see Sean drinking a beer, laughing and joking with the Americans. And I was mm -hmm. thinking... It's, it's, that's not really the reaction to someone that came first out of the mm -hmm. semi-final and you know was in with a really good shout of winning what was not being rude a relatively mm -hmm. weak final without yeah. probably five people you'd at least that yeah. you'd expect to be there yeah and not a weak you know you know poor choice of words yeah um and uh so and i went on a little bit of a rant in print about this and uh yeah i think climbers are still missing that I think if you, you look at Michael Jordan, I mean, pe people say he's a, a psychopath. He's so competitive. He just cannot be lived with by anyone because he is just, um, I, I know, I know somebody played golf with him at a charity event. He said it was just awful. Really? Because he's just, yeah, he just can't, he can't do it. Like a thousand bucks. Who can hit it the furthest? And the guy's like, man, that's just, you know, <laughs> we're, we're in Florida. Let's wow. just soak up the sun. Right. Come on. Who wants to bet me 500 bucks I can't make this putt? It's just like, it's exhausting. Now, you might not like it, but he's the greatest basketball player of all time. Yeah. Uh, you might not like it in other people, but I don't see any successful uh, professional sports that are not completely ruthless. And um, that doesn't mean you can't be friendly, and it doesn't mean you can't be civil, uh, but it probably means you can't be friends in the truest sense of the word with your competitors so you've got to decide what matters um in formula one they call it total competition and that's what we don't have in climbing we don't have that i am i am here to win and if i don't win it's been a bad weekend and if i do win it's been a good weekend and you can of course you can talk about the process and as long as you learned it's all good but if and that is true but Climbers are not yet universally fiercely competitive. So and why, they'll have to be. Why don't we have that? Because, uh, well, a few reasons, I think. Um, well, um, I think one of the reasons is before they didn't have to be. Uh, it didn't really affect anyone's life materially, whether they won or not. Uh, I think that's one thing. And that will begin to change as prize money and sponsorship becomes worth more. And, uh, you know, you mentioned Sean McCall. I'm sure Sean makes an okay living, but he's not setting himself up for life. He's 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 surviving uh, on what he's making. I'm sure he's not a rich man. As people begin to make more and more money, there's going to be a really big incentive to win. Um, and that, that is an incentive. We can't, I, I don't go into this thing of, it's not about the money. If you... If you can set yourself up financially for life, you're going to tear the legs off your competition to get there. I think the other thing is that because climbing competitions originated from something else, which is outdoor climbing and inherently an uncompetitive sport, most people got into climbing as an uncompetitive thing. But you can't, you can't get into soccer and not be competitive. The whole point is there's someone at the other end who's trying to score against you. Mm -hmm. Whereas climbing, you can go down the gym, it's super friendly, you go outside, everyone's friends. That's why I like climbing. But if you get really good and you decide to go down the competition route, you suddenly have to become this competitive animal. And I just, I just think that the way most people got into the sport and the way that the sport is, 
most people most people just uh, didn't get into it for that and i think that's it's quite unique there's very few sports that originate from a non-competitive activity and then ask people to be competitive for the kids coming up like we just in the last week we've seen uh a bunch of new faces show up and and perform very strongly. Uh, And even those kids, you know, we talk about a generation of kids growing up in the gym. Uh, But these particular kids have also spent a lot of time growing up on the rock as well. And maybe it's because they have parents that are so involved in it in some cases. Um, Do you think there's anything we can do to... Like, do you think we're going to be stuck with that legacy uh, of having this uh, inherently non-competitive sport, even though more and more kids are getting involved with it in a competition setting from so young? Like, is it something where we're going to have to live with these kind of, you, you mentioned the the dirtbag lifestyle because Sean Bailey came out in the hoodie kind of thing. And it's something that it's part of the culture that seeps into everybody. Anybody that starts in a gym will be affected by that outdoor culture. A lot of people want to climb outside. You look at half the American team. I'm sure a lot of them would rather be outside than be, be in a competition. Is that something we're always going to be be burdened with? Or do you think there's a chance of this becoming so separate that that mentality doesn't cross over for some of these new athletes? Um, I should point out, I don't necessarily think it's desirable to have fiercely competitive climbers. Uh, so I'm, before anyone gets on my case, I'm, I'm not saying everybody that, and I know you didn't suggest this, but I want to make it clear. I don't think that everybody that starts going to a climbing gym should be competitive and see it as a competition. Sure. I'm just putting, I'm just pointing out that, in my opinion, that's something that a lot of competitors don't have. I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's, um, how can I put this? I think there will always be an element of climbing being a friendly sport, even if you get into competitions quite early on. But I think the com- the competitions will become more competitive, um, not in terms of standard, but in terms of atmosphere and um as that happens, it will become a very clearly separate thing. I still think most people will get into it because they went to a birthday party when they were eight at a climbing gym and they enjoyed it and then it becomes something else. In the same way that when you start playing soccer, you don't play to win. There isn't there is an inherent element of competition, but you start playing because you enjoy it and then if you get quite good, it becomes more competitive. I think climbing will go down the same route. People will always start doing it because it's fun but when they start to compete, they're going to have to get a game face on in a way that maybe you don't now. And I think, yeah, so I, th- I think I think it will become increasingly separate and you'll, you'll kind of say, right, I'm a competitor and I'm going to compete. So I think they will become more separate, yeah. Have you seen a change in attitudes uh, as we get closer uh, towards the Olympics? In some climbers, yeah, and in others not. And um, I don't think... It, I think you you just look at the results and you'll be able to tell which category people fall into. I mean, um, if we look at some of the people that I would be, uh, I think, deserve praise, Adam Ondra, I don't think makes much secret of the fact that he loves outdoor climbing more than he loves competitions. But there is the the most incredible pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, which could be to be the first person to win an Olympic gold medal in climbing. And he sees that and he's just thought, right, I'm going for this. And he is going for it. He doesn't really climb outside that much. Uh, I live a mile away from the Innsbruck Climbing uh, Cletter Centrum. Any time I go there, Adam's in there. He's training the speed wall. He's training the lead wall. Um, he's uh, he's really, really going for it. And look, look at the results. And I think the same is true of Alex Megos um, last year kind of openly thought the whole thing was just a bit of fun. Anytime you asked him, he'd say, oh, I'm just, I'm seeing, I mean, the Olympics would be cool, but mm-hmm. let's see. He's kind of realized that actually he's pretty good at this. And now when he does not perform well, uh, happy, friendly, lovable Alex, who I've known for quite a long time now, uh, is not a very nice person to be around. And that's a competitor. Uh, so I, I think... Um, I think there are people that are that are developing it, and the results the results are showing. And if you don't develop it, you'll get left behind. There's no sport in the world where uncompetitive people survive alongside competitive people. In your interview with uh, Yanya a while back, uh, towards the end, you were talking about how you feel that um, I don't want to word this incorrectly that uh, some athletes maybe weren't adapting to this Olympic challenge as well as uh, you were hoping. Could you expand on on that or? Um, sorry, I don't know if I want to put it. 
yeah, I'll leave it at that. That some athletes. Where, where, where was this on a, on my podcast? Yeah, on uh, on the uh, on, on your podcast. Yeah, I haven't listened to it for a while. You mean was I was I basically saying a lot of people haven't kind of stepped up? No, it was. Uh, it seemed to imply that you felt that there were some athletes who. Uh, um, I don't want to say uh, kind of like uh, damaging themselves, but that some people um, I didn't want to word this as the Olympics was um, like to the detriment of climbers, but it seems like some climbers were maybe chasing the Olympic dream to a detriment to themselves or uh, starting to like change their, their climbing or their career in, in not a great way because of this. Um I wish I'd write, written down the exact quote because then no, it'd be easier well, to jog your memory. I, but I said it and I can't remember it. Um, yeah, I, I, I think um, one thing I would say is there's a lot of people going for the Olympics who, who are not going to get there. And that's kind of hard to watch. Sure. You know, people sacrificing their performance in one discipline and they're, just, they're not going to get to the Olympics. And uh, obviously naming no names, but you mm. definitely see climbers and I'll talk to them and go, yeah. And they'll go, yeah, I'm doing the combined for the Olympics. And I just think, no, no way. You're, mm. like, you're not going to get there. Um, yeah. One thing that's been interesting this season is how little the combined training has had uh, an effect. So, which makes, cause I, interview, I did that interview with Yanya in, um, Xiamen last October at the end of last season, yeah, 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 and I kind of felt like uh, I kind of felt like this season the results would just be all over the place from people sacrificing one discipline performance. But it, to me, it feels like it hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. It feels like good people are still good at what they were good at, right? Um, and the specialists haven't cleaned up in the. Th I thought if you were a specialist boulder, you would just clean up this season. Mm -hmm. um, Lee, yeah, and and, and lead as well. Um, but yeah, I, I, I've been surprised at how it hasn't brought the level down. Almost, I would I would say that. But I, I actually don't remember this, the point I was making at the time. Sorry. Sure. Yeah. No, that's uh, that's no problem. I guess uh, uh, it, was, it was the end of the season. You know, I was I was pretty whacked. We sure. Were in a little bit you know. delirious. Yeah. No. No kidding. A little bit delirious. There's yeah. a bit of pollution. Yeah. In Shia. Um. I'm just going to ask you like some kind of speculative stuff about next season because this is something I've been wondering is next season is unique in that it will have presumably a World Cup season uh, uh, as every year before it but for 20 of of the approximately best athletes in those disciplines they're going to have a much uh, bigger prize to chase um, now the calendar this year for the World Cups has naturally left a whole uh in this case for this season to allow the world championships. And that's basically in the same window that the Olympics is um, from what you've been hearing from athletes. If you've been asking them this, uh, are there people who, if they make the Olympics, are they going to be sitting out some stuff or is it going to be kind oh, yeah, of a, yeah, let's do sure. all of it? No, for sure. I mean, it's already happening. Sure. Uh, Adam didn't come to Brianne's son. Mm -hmm. um, Shauna Cox. So you, yeah. You've seen like, you see he's been absent, occasion. basically. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Every time I see him, I'm like, oh, hey, how are you? How's yeah. it going? Not seen you for a while. Yeah. And we've been to four World Cups since I've last seen it. Mm -hmm. um, it's already happening. And mm -hmm. I think next year, people, it'll be different, obviously, for the. So, you, you know, one of the routes in is through the Continental Champs. But the people that haven't been, I'm just trying to think, will anyone not have been selected when the season starts uh, i think some of the, i wanted to say there was one event in may maybe so there might i think the, i think the asian one is in may yeah possibly but, uh so there will be a very small number of climbers who are not guaranteed to go who will end up going but i think basically at the start of the world cup season the majority of people who are going to go will know they're going and i, I think they'll absolutely use the world cups um as they see fit and uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really begun happening this year. You haven't got Jakob and Jesse at a lead World Cup. I mean, they're the two lead world champions, and it's one of the most. Briansson's one of the most prestigious World Cups. I mean, go. Um, I, I, I feel like the best preparation for competition is competition. So I was disappointed they didn't go, but I don't know how exercise physiology works. So maybe hmm. the coaches, maybe they're on the training program and, and whatever. But. Um, yeah, we, we, we've already begun to see it loads, and we will see it ne next year. I believe we've got a pretty much normal World Cup calendar, and uh, I think it'll it'll be all over the place who enters what. Because now, of course, people are entering to get a ranking. Mm -hmm. 
in order to qualify for Hachioji or Toulouse. Um, when there's no need for a World Cup ranking, I, I, I guess they will do it according to the timing of their their um, their training program. So if they're training, if they're on a, a power training uh, month, for example, they might go to a World Cup at the end of it, see how effective it was. Or I'm getting so far out of my depth, I can't see the sure. show now. Um, yeah, no, that's fine. So <laughs> when it comes to physiology, I mean, uh, but I yes, it will it will happen a lot. And next season, I think will be a really odd World Cup season. Do you, do you feel like even even in this season then? Because I guess the question that I that I'm coming to is is uh, it's still a small sport. There's not a ton of attention that gets put on achievements of of like winning a World Cup season and and medals are even more kind of random sometimes. But uh, do you feel like this is is effectively going to leave one of those seasons with giant asterisks beside the results? Is it something where it you feel like it might be taken less seriously or that it could kind of end up being a bit of a speed bump? Uh, including this year where it just kind of throws off the history of of uh, competitive climbing because the olympics by itself isn't something i'm ever going to look to and say hey that's a great barometer for who is the most dominant person this year in the same way that i don't say that about the world championships like you're always going to get one or two dark horses in the finals of a world championship it's a single event um and with the entire season possibly boiling down to one of these in a in a somewhat slightly objectionable format if you're talking about genuine excellence in any discipline it it leaves that the rest of the season might be kind of diluted uh when i find that the season itself is the most kind of important achievement uh yeah no comment on the format <laughs> uh, I, I take the fifth sure um, yeah that's totally fine it's it's like the, that ground has been well trodden by everybody it's no problem it's a yeah, it's exactly. an important they, they, compromise they, they, we understand yeah, they can manage without me walking over it. Um, mm. Yeah, I I don't think the season will be devalued. I, th I think um, you make a really good point then, which is that it will skew our view of who is the greatest. So, for example, if the Olympics had never happened, mm -hmm. I can't help thinking Yanya might have won 10 lead seasons in a row. Sure. I don't know, because um, I would think one of the reasons she didn't she hasn't won uh, two out of the last three lead World Cups we've just had in the outs was that she wasn't lead fit and the, the reason why she wasn't lead fit was she was bouldering uh, and the reason she was bouldering was uh, and so on and so forth well she loves bouldering but bad example but you know what I mean yep. um, but by the same token you can only beat who's put in front of you yes. and um, whether it's devalued or not is, uh, is again like it's pure speculation if you get two pretty crap teams in the Super Bowl because, mm -hmm. you know, it was raining and they kicked a field goal and won 3 nothing yeah. and beat a better... Like, you can only beat who you beat. And I think... Uh, I, don't, I don't think the World Cups will be devalued, but I think uh, winning a World Cup or winning a World Cup uh, overall title will not make you the best climber in that discipline. Mm -hmm. Which is a shame, but... Uh, that's life. I mean, I, I just I don't see a way around it. If we if we're going for the Olympics, there's no way it can't have massive knock on effects to the normal season. Mm -hmm. I guess. Um, do you, before I ask the next next question, do you want to say anything about the Olympic format as either to placate people to uh, to to give people any hope about it? Otherwise, I'm going to ask you something else. So just in case you have any insight or anecdotes that that might be uh important otherwise we're skipping it well i really like speed climbing sure because let's face it no one's nobody's bitching about the fat boulderings involved in the, no. in the three no. disciplines we all yeah. we all know what the the um the target of people's annoyance is mm -hmm. uh, i don't think i'd be giving away the world's biggest inside secret if i said that speed, speed climbing is the least popular mm -hmm. of the disciplines amongst climbing fans but I really like it, and uh, in the same way that you can only beat who you're up against, that's the format. So watch it, don't watch it, compete, don't compete, I don't really care. That's the format. Live with it and, and move on. I get really fed up with people. Oh, I can't believe they're, can't believe they're taking the speed mm -hmm. climate. Well, they have. Yeah. So just live with it. Like, I'm sorry, I'm getting on the rant. Is like, there... It, just, it is what it is, and... 
whether you agree with it or disagree with it, that, that's what happened. It was decided years ago. The athletes have all accepted it. Sure, Adam Ondra would prefer to be out in Sayus and training speed climbing. But that's what he's got to do, and mm. that's what he's doing. Yeah. And, and that's my take on it. It is what it is. The speed climbing has, an, uh, like has, has unquestionably grown quite a lot. I don't know what just happened. Your window just disappeared. I just shrunk. Yeah, you just said uh, <laughs> I don't I don't even know what to do about this. Let me just find I'm just gonna say it might have the resolution might have dropped or something. Anyway, hilarious, I'm hilarious little I'm gonna you're probably gonna blow back up if the internet gets a stronger connection or something. So I'm just gonna we're just gonna fake this a little bit. There we go. See, it's fine. Um so speed climbing has it's it's been an incredible gift for speed climbing having it included in the olympics just seeing it in north america in my area the involvement of athletes that never would have done it before has gone through the roof and tons of these athletes are finding it incredibly fun something that they love including as part of their training calendar uh uh, even without, you know, most of these kids are not going to go to the Olympics. They're not going to go to the world championships. They just, now that this exists and now that there's maybe that wall that showed up in the, in the town nearby, it's something that people are really enjoying. Um, so it's, it, I think it's mostly been a revelation for most climbers or indoor climbers that, Hey, this is actually really fun. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and I've also said repeatedly, it's the most Olympic of the disciplines. That, that was the next point is that it was the yeah. one that was effectively developed for exactly this kind of event right it's it's built with yeah. clearly understandable rules uh and something that just makes sense from an eye test at all times um there have been now generations of speed climbers who have lived with uh with uh i don't want to say that, that uh try i'm lost for a, a word here but they uh have been considered kind of invalid climbers they haven't been considered part of a, a real climbing community for decades and a lot of those climbers that set the world records, that had so much input in how the sport developed, who were legends in their own right, they're not going to be at the Olympics because of this particular format. They're, or just because, you know, a lot of them have aged out. There we go again. Well, oh, I don't want to move that. <laughs> don't worry, this is fine. Nobody's here for our faces. It's, it's totally cool. Um, yeah, I, I, gener I generally listen to the debrief rather than watch it. So no one's... <laughs> this is, I don't know what's going This is wild. We're really, anyway, okay, that's Charlie Bosco, the little uh, phone. Anyway, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is it feels like uh, this gift of speed climbing has been given to the climbing community at the sacrifice of the people that built it and that created it and that took all of that, you know, just all that shit talk for so long. Um, do you find athletes or speed athletes are... Uh, um, are you getting that vibe from the speed athletes where they feel like, man, we, you know, we felt like we built this thing and everybody's just getting on board and we're not going to reap any of the benefits from it. It's going to be the next generation. Is there any kind of tone of resentment or are they just happy that they're involved or that people are recognizing that they are part of an incredible sport? Um, firstly, good multitasking. Um, <laughs> no, I haven't heard that. It, although that's kind of the first time I've heard it raised and it's it's a not unreasonable point um, but I guess nobody got into speed climbing because of the Olympics so they chose to be there in the first place and much as boulders and lead climbers are having to speed climb and much as they have to live with the Olympic format whether they like it or not I guess the same is true of speed climbers if, if they're really hacked off that they're sport has now been hijacked for the Olympics. They should get good at the others, mm -hmm. just as lead and boulders, who might be annoyed that speed climbers going, have to get good at speed climbing. I would say the speed climbers, like I said, the format's what it is. There you go. You knew years ago, like, even before the announcement was made, no one thought we were going to get three medals. Mm -hmm. So if they were serious about milking their advantage and their work in developing speed climbing, they've had plenty of time to do it. So I haven't heard any... Um, any resentment um but i don't speak russian which kind of rules out <laughs> talking to quite a lot of them yeah yeah that's fair so, uh, see, but that's about all i picked up in <laughs> moscow um so off off the olympic format i just wanted to ask about uh formats for climbing so in in two scales so the first one is uh how competitions themselves are run so the rules around a bouldering competition or around a lead competition in terms of scoring and things like that. But on the other end, uh, how an IFSC season works, um, how there is a world championship and how there are uh, uh, 
like a World Cup circuit. Um, you pay attention to a lot of other sports uh, just as a, as a spectator. And of course, you spend a lot of time in climbing and having to communicate it and getting it across to people. Um, are there parts of these formats that you wish worked a different way or that you feel uh, don't contribute as much as, uh, as much as they should? Are there places you'd like to improve with how uh, climbing formats uh, are implemented? Uh, there are changes I would make, yeah. I would have, um, if it was up to me, I'd prefer to have less people in the elite semi-final. Okay. Um, I feel like they are t- too long. It's, it's actually, um, it's actually fine for me. Oh, there I go again. <laughs> uh, it's actually fine for me because um, I'm sitting in the venue and being entertained. But I, I don't think they make as good a show for people at home uh, as they would if they had fewer people in. Uh, and. I would also uh, choose, if I had my choice, I would put the finals for the bouldering back together. But I know the problems, uh, I know why they were split up, which is so why you're, s- one you're saying you would, you would want the men's and women's finals and bouldering running concurrently again? Is that what you'd uh, prefer? Yeah, I'd, if I could click my fingers, yeah. Okay. Um, why is that? Just um, because. Uh, if the final is not a certain type of final, there's a lot of dead time. Sure. And um, I get paid to fill it. It's no problem to fill it. But I'm very aware that there's only so much I can do. Despite my uh, good looks and overwhelming charisma, <laughs> I, I cannot make someone sitting on a mat entertaining for that long. Yeah. Um, and the problem we have when you when you split the finals is that if it's not a good final or a boulder doesn't work it's not good entertainment and um everyone's everyone's got their role at the ifsc and, and in in any business and my job is how do we make the show as good as possible and i don't think uh, i think very 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 occasionally having to show a replay of a top because we were looking at the wrong climate is preferable to very prolonged periods of nothing happening so I, I would put them together, but I know I understand why they were split up, and I know uh, a lot of the TV companies ask for them to be split up, and uh, generally what they say goes. But if I if I could wave a magic wand, I would I would say they were better better when they run concurrently. Okay, um, we'll end on one last question because I don't want to fight the internet too much, and we're we're just over an hour, so this is actually perfect. Um, I feel like this is going to be a tough question for you because I know you 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 want to stay fairly impartial. So I'm not going to ask you who you think is going to end up on an Olympic podium or anything like no, you that. Can, you can you can ask. That. Don't I'm gonna if you if you let me I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you. I, what, I, I can I can give predictions. Well, I mean, so, if you've watched the IFC live streams the last few years, you know that whatever I say, instantly bet on the opposite, and you will. <laughs> yeah, you're yeah, sure. Rich, rich man. Well, let me. I'll, I'm going to ask my original question, and if you don't want to, then right. that's fine. But the original question was and you get to determine the frameworks as to how you decide this is if you got to choose the dream olympic podium uh coming out of tokyo 2020 the top three men and the top three women uh whether you want to base this uh this off of who you genuinely think is most likely to win or if you want to base it off of what would be the best for the sport or the kind of like ideal athletes to win it. I would just like to know what your kind of your dream top three would be for the men and the women coming out of the 2020 Olympics. Well, um, obviously there are some climbers as with any group of hundreds of people, there are some climbers I get on better with than others, uh, which is inevitable in any social situation. So there are some climbers I would like to win because I like them. Uh, some of those climbers have as much chance of winning it as I do. So um, <laughs> I've got to forget that. My dream uh, dream podium for me is that the climbing community thinks that they are the best climber. I, don't, I, I would hate for someone to fluff it in the speed climbing. I want names, Charlie. Don't back out of this. No, I want I'll, names. No, I'm not, I'm not going to back out. I'm, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kind of preemptively uh, All right. my ass. Uh, I want the the criteria I have for my dream podium because I don't I don't care who wins mm-hmm. other than I like some people more than others and I'd like to see them win. Um, the dream podium would be the climbing community recognizes that yes they were the best climber and mm-hmm. they don't get caught or cost what if they look like the best lead and boulderer I want them to win. 
because mm-hmm. the climbing community will instantly say that's ridiculous they lost because of speed mm-hmm. so i want the climbing community to say yeah the right person won and i want it to be someone who uh, on both men's and women's side who will represent the sport will and the general public beyond the climbing community will take to because that is good for all of us mm-hmm. i think the winner of the men's will be jakob schubert and i think the winner of the women's will be Jan. and uh, they could be completely wrong. I, I'm pretty confident on the Yanni one, I've got to be honest. Sure. Uh, I don't think anyone's arguing with that, are they? Maybe? Uh, if, if they do, it's mostly off speculation. Like, I mean, I'm I'm betting pretty high on this Chai Yun train, but that's completely hype. So, you know, I haven't seen yeah, a boulder no, before, no, so I really got no idea. No, I agree. But, uh, I mean, what are we on now? Wednesday. So 20 days ago, none of us had ever heard of it. Yeah, so exactly. I, I, yeah. I, I, she's got a, she's got work to do before she convinces me that she's going to beat Yanya. I in live in the, the in the Toronto sports market, so I, I, I am a, uh, I'm a bandwagon hopper. That's 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 what I do here because we don't usually win stuff on our own. So that's just part Blue of my, days. it's part of my DNA. Um, and uh, on the men's side, I think it's really competitive, and I would not be surprised if Jakob didn't make the podium. But I just I watched him last year in Innsbruck, and then a few weeks ago I went down to the Kletter Centre and they had the Austrian National Championships. The guy's reigning lead world champion, reigning World Cup season champion in the lead, uh, won a bouldering World Cup this year. Pretty, pretty effing quick on a speed wall. Mm-hmm. Really gets competition, gets how to compete, gets how to get the best out of himself and be a competitor in the truest sense of the word. And much as I think Adam Ondra is the best climber who's ever lived as an all-rounder, I, ju- I was just watching Jakob, and that's like you see him down the wall, and just just from knowing him, I just think, wow, you want to win the gold medal, you've got to beat him. I I just don't see uh, anyone with the all-round skill set, not necessarily climbing, but competition, ability to prepare, understanding of yourself, psychology. I just don't see anyone who's got quite a strong all-round package as Jakob, but. It could, honestly, it could. There's probably, I think there's probably how many guys do I realistically think could win it? I think there's probably realistically four guys I think could win the gold medal. Uh, and I would say Jakob would be my favorite. So, my, my guess just coming out of that would be Jakob, uh, Adam, Tomoa. Who's your fourth? Um, if you had one in mind, particular. Yeah, I did. Uh, I think. You, Jan de Hoyer could be not a million really? miles away. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, um, I don't, no, in fact, I, don't, I, don't, I think I think I'm going to adjust my my targets. I think it's probably between Tomoa, Adam, and Jakob. Sure. But, um, the competition is so strong that um, yeah, it could be it could be any of them. It could be none of them. All right. But I would I would I would. Give me ten bucks of your money. It's going on, yeah. I was, I was all right. Cool. And uh, if any, if it follows the trend, well, hopefully it doesn't follow the trend. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you haven't just cursed these athletes to to a, <laughs> a life of uh, of uh, of missing out on on medals just, from just here broadcast, on out. Broadcast this in September twenty twenty, and then <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's uh, let's leave it there. I don't want us to struggle through the internet, and that's that's a, just a, a good way to end off. Um, I know for sure we'll end up talking again. Um, yeah. Let's let's make sure a year from now, before we go into the Olympics, we can revisit this and uh, and uh, and see where things are at. But uh, otherwise, I just wanted to say thanks for making this time, and I hope you enjoy the couple weeks leading into the World Championships. <laughs> the family wants you back. Yeah, no, she just came in naked. I think she peed on the floor, actually. Anyway. Well, that's a good time to wrap it up. It sounds like you got other stuff to take care of. <laughs> yeah, kid, kids, not wife. My wife sure. peed on the floor. <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, Charlie Bosco, thanks uh, thanks so much for, for taking this time. Hey, uh, yeah. Uh, and, no I just want... and keep up the good work with the briefs. I've well, got thanks. them down. I've got a backlog, uh, but I've got them uh, ripped off YouTube 
uh, and I'll be uh, listening to them on the way to Hatch Georgia in a few weeks. Awesome. Good to know. I wish you the best of luck with, uh, with the World Championships, and, uh, and we'll talk on the other side of that. But otherwise, thanks, everybody, for watching. Uh, if you didn't watch part one, make sure you uh, check out part one. I'll leave a link in the description. And, of course, uh, subscribe for more interviews uh, and debriefs and everything involving uh, gym and competitive climbing culture. Uh, this has been the Plastic Weekly interview with Charlie Bosco. Thanks so much.